Good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending on when you choose to watch this video. I'm Chris Weber, the pastor at St. Peter's Lutheran Church here in St. Paul, Minnesota, and I pray that this video finds you well wherever you are today. Today we're going to continue, uh, I'm going to continue talking about Matthew 18 and this topic of reconciliation and, and, and what it is to be living in a relationship that is marked by forgiveness. But before we do that, if you haven't already, find a spot to sit. If you're doing something, stop whatever it is you're doing. And we're going to take a moment to remember who we are through our new identity in Christ. So take a nice deep breath with me if you are willing as we remember that gifted identity. We are those who have been baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. A reading from Matthew 18. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fellow and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. 
he refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Here ends the reading. To all of you children out there listening today, it feels good when other people love us. When we get to play a game with our, a parent or, or go for a walk with a, a good friend, when we get to be held by and feel safe by a, a grandparent, a parent, or, or somebody else, we feel safe, we feel loved. And there's this energy, this, this power that's in that love from another that actually makes it easier to be loving towards others, right? When we feel safe and secure, when we feel loved by our, our parents or our grandparents or other relationships, when we feel cared for, it's easier to engage in relationships with others, whether it's siblings or friends where we might feel kind of angry. If we feel loved by others, it's easier to go about living in love towards others. This is why it's so important for parents and grandparents and the like to create such a safe and loving environment for you as children. But God has this wonderful relationship for us that also is a relationship of love. And it is one that we live in all the time. God has taken us into his arms in Jesus Christ, forgiving our sins, taking away the, the bad things that we might think or, or do. He takes that away and he heals our relationship with him. And we live in that all the time. We are always in a relationship in which God says, you're mine, you belong to me. And in that relationship, there is safety. And in that relationship of love, there is also this energy to take that love and share that love with others. When we have a hard time being loving or caring towards a sibling, a cousin, a friend, or somebody else, what we can do is we can go back and we can remember that God's caring for us. In Christ, he is holding us and keeping us safe for eternity and out of the strength of that love that he has for us, we ask him to say, please help me bring that love to others as well. It is wonderful to have this relationship with God because it is a constant. Sometimes in our relationships with parents, we may not get what we want with playing a game or, or, or having a time to read a book or something like that. But we always have this constant in Christ to fall back on that is our foundation, that in him we have a relationship of love for our comfort, and to help us as we care for other people too. For the rest of you out there listening today, <clears throat> last week I spoke about the first half of Matthew 18, in which Jesus focuses in on who is the greatest in the kingdom. And he highlights that the greatest are those that are weak, prone to stray, and dependent upon others. And that conversation really focused heavily upon reconciliation. Our text for today is a direct continuation of that conversation. And Peter has been listening to Jesus. He's tracking along exactly with what Jesus seems to be talking about, right? Go to your brother when he sins against you. Keep going and forgive, right? Seek reconciliation. Peter's listening. He's tracking along and he asks a logical question. How many times am I supposed to do this, Lord? If my brother sins against me seven times, am I supposed to go and forgive him seven times? Jesus' response points out that it's not about how many times. Rather, his response points out that we are grounded in a foundational relationship of grace with God, and that shapes how we can go and bring forgiveness to fellow believers in Christ. And he does this by telling a parable. 
a servant is brought before his king, and the servant owes the king a sum of money, has a debt to the king. 10,000 talents. Kind of sounds like a lot, right? 10,000, not some insignificant number, 10,000. But this isn't just a large amount of money. This is an absurd amount of debt. And, and I want to take a moment to kind of walk through ancient Israel uh, monetary system or the, the finance system that they had, which I know you're probably just dying to know, just itching and wanting to learn about ancient Israel finances today. Regardless, this is really important as it helps us understand this parable. A denarius was worth about a day's wages. Now, there's a little bit of discrepancy there depending on when and where you would measure the denarius and all of that in those days. But for our purposes today, a denarius is worth about a day's wages. You work a day, you earn about a denarius. A talent was equal to about 6,000 denarii. So you work 6,000 days or roughly 16 years or more, seven days a week with nonstop, you would have about a talent's worth of pay. This servant owes 10,000 talents as far as his debt goes. That's 60 million days of work. To put it in a different perspective, 164,000 years of work, working seven days a week, 365 days nonstop with no sick days or breaks. That's over a thousand lifetimes. This is an absurd amount of debt that this man owes to his king. And his response is also all the more absurd. The man is panicked. He's terrified. He is about to be sold and his wife and his kids sold to pay off, I mean, a small, minute fraction of this astronomical debt. And in his fear, he cries out, give me more time, right? Have patience with me. I'll pay you back, which is impossible, right? He doesn't have enough time in multiple lifetimes to be able to pay the king back. He is stuck and he is without hope. There is nothing this man can do to get himself out of this position. But the king, the king in that moment has compassion and he cancels the man's debt. In an, an absurd action of compassion, the king cancels the man's debt. This is no light matter. I mean, if we think about debt in terms of today, Consider if a bank chose to cancel all of the debt that was owed through that bank. Car loans, mortgages, uh, credit card loans, whatever. Just completely cancel them all. That would be a dangerous thing for the bank to do, right? Because that's a lot of money the bank is out of and they would be in danger as a business. This is no light matter for this king to cancel this debt. In fact, I think we often have a tendency, because we know the story so well, to assume, of course the king is going to be merciful, right? Of course the king is going to cancel the debt, and it doesn't matter how big it may seem, of course the king is going to forgive. But this story from Jesus should never stop to shock us again and again. And should never stop to humble us again and again because the story of this king canceling this unpayable debt is the story of God's forgiveness for his people, including you and me. In our relationship with God, we were in a position where we could not possibly pay. Our sin created a hole like a giant financial debt that was unpayable, right? This debt, this break in this relationship, and, and no amount of work on our part, no amount of time on our part, no amount of hollow pleas and begging for more effort, or I'll just try to do this to fix it, or I'll pay a little bit of it back. None of that would ever fix the gap between us and God because of our sin. We were stuck and without hope. But in an instant, 
God sends his son, and his son is willing to pay the price for us and to cancel our debts, to take away the sin that has separated us from God, even if it means his own death and the loss of his life. He is willing to go through that in order to bring us release. And it's a complete gift of grace, right? Any of our hollow pleas for more time wouldn't matter. God chooses to act purely out of his compassion for us. And what we were unable to fix, God takes the matter into his hands and heals our relationship with him once and for all in Christ. Now, I want you to take a moment to use your imagination. And put yourself in the shoes of that servant, but in a contemporary way. Imagine that you have debt, and, and maybe you do, and, and maybe you don't. Uh, but imagine you've got a, a home loan, a mortgage, a, a car loan through the bank, credit card debt through that bank, and maybe even some student loans still hanging around, right? There is a burden to having to pay that stuff every single month that it just seems to always be there. And imagine that you've got that debt. And suddenly one day the phone rings. You pick up the phone and it's the bank calling you. And they have randomly selected you amongst all of their clients to cancel all of your debt. Now, I know this is entirely unlikely, but just run with this for a minute. There would probably be a moment on the phone of, of disbelief, right? This is a prank, I need to hang up quick. And they would say, no, it's going to show up on your next statement. It's all gone. There's no strings attached. You don't need to do anything. We're just doing this for you. There'd be a fair amount of shock, disbelief, even as you hang up the phone. But at some point, the reality is going to set in that that burden is gone. It's completely gone. No more mortgage, no more car loans, no more credit card debt. It's just, you're just free from all of that debt. And imagine that as that sets in, there'd be a sense of joy and excitement and maybe even elation of just this energy of, wow, I'm free from that debt. And as you're feeling that joy, suddenly the phone rings again and you pick up the phone and it's a good friend of yours, a friend who happens to owe you some money. What would you do? As the servant leaves the king's presence leaving the presence of the king who seems to have this unlimited forgiveness, canceling a debt that would be an equivalent today to an individual debt of billions of dollars, that that servant walks away forgiven, that debt completely canceled. And as he walks out of the king's presence, he comes across another servant, a servant who owes that forgiven servant some money as well, a hundred denarii roughly a hundred days worth of pay. Not an insignificant amount, right? Three to four months of work. This isn't insignificant, but in comparison with 164,000 years worth of work, it doesn't quite compare. And what does this forgiven servant do? He starts strangling the one that owes him the hundred days worth of money. Strangle him saying, pay me back every penny that you owe. And the servant starts to beg saying, Give me some more time. Be patient with me, and I will pay you back everything. Sounds familiar, right? Well, that servant that was forgiven by the king has no mercy whatsoever. Throws his fellow servant in jail, demanding that he gets back every last cent. The king, the king finds out about this situation calls the servant that he had forgiven back into his presence, and he's furious. I canceled all of that unpayable debt to you. Completely canceled it. You had nothing you could possibly do, and I had mercy on you and canceled that. You should have taken that new relationship of mercy with you and treated other people with mercy as well. And in his anger, the king takes that debt that was canceled from that servant, puts it back on his shoulders, and throws him into prison. You see, the act of canceling the debt was not simply a gift for the servant. 
It was a redefining of the relationship between the king and his servant, a relationship that was marked by forgiveness, by mercy. And that relationship that the servant had with the king was meant to redefine how the servant interacted with other people. Jesus drives this point home, that if we have received a relationship of mercy with God, then we should be merciful towards others. And something that I think often gets in the way for us today is that we sometimes think about God's forgiveness as this, like, this item that when we feel guilty, we pull out this item and it makes us feel better. Or when we've done something wrong, we take the item off the shelf and, oh, it comforts us because we're forgiven. It's like we are consuming God's forgiveness whenever we need it, bringing it to mind when we're uncomfortable. But it's not simply something that makes us feel better. God's mercy is a redefinition of our relationship with God, a relationship we are in with him all the time because of his mercy. And if we have a, a new relationship that is defined by God's grace for us, an undeserved gift, that defining relationship shapes us to act differently towards others. To refuse mercy to another Christian person is, according to Jesus, an affront. It stands in opposition to God's mercy for us, right? If we have been, if we have received mercy from God, we should be giving mercy to our fellow disciples. If we refuse mercy, what does that say about our relationship of what we think of God's grace to us? This reality of carrying out mercy in our relationships to others is really, really hard. And I think it's important to point out today that the difficulty of forgiveness is not what this text is addressing. Peter didn't ask Jesus, wow, Jesus, forgiving people again and again seems really hard. What do we do when it gets difficult? No, Peter asked, how many times am I supposed to forgive? Jesus points out that's the wrong question, right? Your relationship with God is defined by mercy, undeserved mercy, and that is the source that leads us to be able to bring forgiveness to other people as many times as we may need to do so. Jesus is not addressing the challenge of forgiving other people, and it is a real challenge for us today. There are times where living a life of forgiveness in a relationship seems impossible, or we wonder, how in the world can I forgive this person for what they did or what they said? Or sometimes we might be wondering, if I'm having a hard time forgiving somebody, does that mean I'm refusing mercy and God's going to take away his grace from me? That's not what this text is about. If you are having challenges in the midst of a life of forgiving somebody else or living a life of mercy or challenges and understanding what that looks like because it's hard for all of us feel free to reach out to me i'd be happy to listen and, and talk with you through those things because just because we're having a hard time forgiving somebody doesn't mean we are refusing them grace Nevertheless, the force of Jesus' words is a very stern warning. Warning: If we refuse mercy to a disciple, that is a dangerous position because we are, in a sense, refusing God's mercy that he has given to us and not seeing that it is meant to redefine how we act towards others. So what do we do, at least in a very general way, what do we do when forgiving someone is hard? when we may be withholding forgiveness or not sure how we can forgive, or, or maybe when we are actually refusing forgiveness, whether we realize it or not, or, or even when forgiving somebody is easy. In every single situation, we are called to do the same thing, to continue to rest upon the foundational relationship we have in Christ, that we are forgiven that that is not only a source of comfort for us, that the unpayable debt we had because of sin has been canceled. Not only that that is comforting to us, but that is also the source of the energy in the spirit that drives us in our relationships to manifest mercy to others. 
And so no matter what is going on in our relationships, we keep going back to be shocked by God's mercy, to be humbled by his grace, and to seek his energy and support in going out and carrying that mercy, that new relationship we have in how we relate to others. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the forgiveness you have given. Sometimes we remember the depths of our sin and sometimes we are not so aware of it. But our break in our relationship with you was unrepairable on our end. No amount of time or effort could have fixed it. And yet, you in mercy reclaimed us for your own and forgave us purely out of your compassion. Help us to rejoice in that each day. Help us to find such a deep comfort in that, but also to see it as a redefinition of our relationship with you and to live out that mercy in our relationship with others by the power of your spirit. Help us in your church around the world to do this very difficult task and to seek the support of one another as we struggle in doing this work. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for the many, many, many people who are suffering because of the fires uh, in the western portion of our country. We pray for those fires to stop, send rain, send firefighters and their work, send crews of people to get people into places that are safe. Be with the people who are grieving the loss of life, especially, but also the loss of property and homes, the the destruction of various areas that has been taking place. Bring the beauty of your order even in the midst of that chaos. For you are the God who breathes beauty by your spirit, even in the darkest moments. Bring healing to those areas. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the uh, people involved in the destruction of the fires that affected the the migrant camps in Greece, the, the Mariah camps. Many people have been displaced for that person per, uh, in those events and, and displaced even as they've already been displaced as migrants as well. Uh, bring food, bring shelter, bring healing, bring changes uh, in the countries around them that care can be provided to the many children that are there and to the many adults who need help as well. Send love and care through your people that peace would abound, Lord, in your mercy. We continue to pray for the many schools that have opened and are opening and the challenges that that brings as uh, the coronavirus continues to spread through schools at times. And we pray for the, the many students and schools who are grieving as there are at times teachers who have already died from this disease as well. This is such a challenging and frustrating time. Bring healing, bring protection, and bring peace. And, and bring a unity to our, our, the people in this country that is so needed to tackle such a big problem as we have been facing. Lord, in your mercy. In all of these very dark and troubling realities that have been going on, Lord, we pray for joy. And we pray that we would not lose sight of the joy that you have given to us. First and foremost, the joy of salvation, of forgiveness, and of the promise of eternity. But also the other joys we encounter each day. The beauty of the color of flowers, the beauty of the sky, the colors of trees and, and, um, and various things in the world. The, the smile of, of friendly faces and, and other small things, even the taste of food and the the various beauties and blessings you've woven into your creation. Help us to find joy in these small and great things, especially in times that seem so troubling. Lord, in your mercy. Trusting in your promises, we are bold to pray as you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 
Again, I pray that this video finds you well wherever you are today. And wherever you are, I pray that the Lord would bless you and keep you. That the Lord would make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. I pray the Lord would look upon you with favor and give you his peace as those who live in a relationship marked entirely by God's mercy and his forgiveness. Continue to make wise choices about the places you go, the people you see, the interactions you have, and love for your neighbor. Carry out the many vocations we have. I know I list many, but there's children, grandchildren, parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, are all vocations, as well as parent, or, uh, students, teachers, uh, various food services, industry workers, so many vocations, and the opportunities to be the hands and feet of Christ. This is what God has called us to as his redeemed creatures. Continue to stay connected together as we need one another. And until we have the opportunity to see each other again, I pray you have a blessed week.